Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for being here. We're covering this, and everyone out there who's watching, wherever you might be. Today, I'm joined by Benjamin Schott with the National Weather Service in New Orleans, and he will, in just a few moments, uh, give you the latest update on Hurricane Ida. Dr. Joe Canner with the Louisiana Department of Health uh, will speak in a minute on COVID and health considerations as we prepare for uh, and respond to this hurricane. We also have on hand today Chip Klein uh, with the CPRA, uh, General Keith Waddell of the Louisiana National Guard, Colonel Lamar Davis with the Louisiana State Police, and also Secretary Jack Monaset with the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, and Jim Wascom with GOSEP. And they will be available uh, at the end of the presentation in order to take any questions that you might want to direct to them. I want to start by acknowledging that today is the one-year anniversary of Hurricane Laura. Um, and while much progress has been made, there's still a long road of recovery left as it relates to the recovery from Hurricane Laura, particularly in southwest Louisiana. Uh, and here we are today faced with another storm setting its sights on Louisiana, uh, this time southeast Louisiana. Uh, we have some very significant updates uh, for you. Uh, what I can tell you is Hurricane Ida is rapidly intensifying, uh, and the situation is changing, it seems, by the hour. Uh, we now believe that there is a strong likelihood that this will be a Category 4 hurricane at landfall. Uh, that's how quickly the storm is developing. Um, I can tell you that I had an opportunity a short while ago to speak with the National Hurricane Center uh, Ken Graham, and he indicated that the storm is sort of ahead of schedule, meaning they had projected it would be at a certain strength at a certain time, and is beating those projections. And what this means is the rapid intensification is happening. Uh, as was expected, it's just happening to a greater degree, or at least faster uh, than expected. So we have a very serious situation on our hands, uh, and it's important that everyone take advantage of all the opportunities that you have, all the time uh, that you have to adequately prepare yourself uh, and your family, uh, and make sure that you stay calm uh, and that, that you do those things that are required to put you and your family in the best possible position to successfully weather the storm. Hurricane Ida is presently projected to make landfall somewhere uh, between Terrebonne and St. Mary Parishes on Sunday evening. Uh, by tomorrow night, tropical storm force winds will begin to move onto the coast of Louisiana. And so the next 24 hours are very, very important. Now is the time to finish your preparations, and I want to encourage everyone to understand that by nightfall tomorrow night, uh, you need to be where you intend to ride out the storm, and you need to be postured as you would want to be as that storm approaches you. Make sure that you're paying attention to your family, to your pets, to elderly loved ones and neighbors. Last night, I was able to send a letter to President Biden requesting a pre-landfall federal emergency declaration. I'm very pleased to announce that uh, he approved it earlier today, and we are very grateful for the fact that he approved it and he did so very quickly. Uh, I was able to speak to the president uh, just a few moments ago, uh, and I will tell you, uh, I was able to thank him personally, but this declaration is a key part of us being able to respond uh, to Hurricane Ida and, and really to prepare in advance of landfall. Uh, yesterday, as you all probably know, I also issued a state of emergency declaration uh, for the state of Louisiana. And so both my declaration and the federal uh, declaration issued by the president are for the entire state of Louisiana. As it happens, yesterday I was in Lake Charles with Administrator Criswell of FEMA uh, at the time that we received uh, the weather briefing, 10 o'clock yesterday morning, which was the first time that we really uh, received notice of a forecasted storm that could be a hurricane uh, when it hit Louisiana, and we were able to start our uh, coordinations and communications uh, at that time. Earlier today was with Health and Human Services Secretary Becerra in New Orleans as well, 
and able to thank him for his disaster medical assistance teams and all of the assets that they had previously sent to Louisiana with respect to the COVID emergency that are going to be much more important now uh, that they're going to continue to work in their capacity as COVID, but, but as this uh, storm develops. Uh, and then there are additional HHS resources that are being brought to bear right now as it relates to the storm. So I had an opportunity to coordinate with him as well. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Ben of the National Weather Services to come up and give us all the latest on what is a very serious storm. Um, and then I will come back up uh, and give some uh, additional remarks uh, after that, and, and we will take uh, questions as well. Ben? Oh, there you are. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hurricane Ida uh, has uh, quickly developed into a hurricane way ahead of schedule, just like the governor had mentioned. Uh, right now, uh, all forecasts uh, tend to look to that it will be a pretty strong Category 4 when it makes uh, landfall on the coast of Louisiana sometime um, on Sunday afternoon or evening. Uh, at that time, it's possible that we could have sustained winds uh, getting close to 140 miles per hour with wind gusts uh, close to or in excess of 170 miles per hour. Um, this is stronger than Laura from last year. This will be a life-altering storm for those who aren't prepared and ready to take uh, what Ida is going to throw at us later this weekend. As you can see on the track here, uh, it's going to be crossing across a pristine environmental conditions for a hurricane to continue to develop, if not rapidly develop which is why we're pretty confident about the Category 4 forecast moving forward for landfall on Sunday. As the governor mentioned, it looks to hit somewhere there close to the central portion of the coastline and then work its way uh, into the central portion of the state. Uh, this is where uh, I think we can remember a little bit about also what Laura did, because I think we'll see some similar conditions here, where when you have a storm moving at around 15 or so miles per hour, uh, directly into the center of the state, you are going to have a significant large path of wind damage, trees down, power outages, and concerns uh, from that wind uh, over 100 miles per hour working way inland. And I'll show some graphics to give the exact extent of that kind of push of the wind later on. There are multiple other threats with this storm. A lot of folks will focus on the category, and they should in this case with it being a category four. It does have, um, you know, obviously a, a significant wind threat, but there are other significant threats that are life-threatening as well, and I'll kind of work my way through some of those uh, through the rest of the briefing here. As the governor mentioned, uh, this is the earliest time that we expect to see the beginning of uh, conditions starting to deteriorate. If you notice on the graphic there, it shows it being uh, somewhere late Saturday night into uh, early Sunday morning, uh, spreading into the state. The uh, color part of the graphic there is the percentage that we will see tropical storm force winds. As you can see, almost all of southern and southeastern Louisiana uh, are in excess of 70 or 80 percent chance for uh, you know, tropical storm winds at least. So this is definitely something for everyone to prepare for. Uh, I show this graphic here also to try to remove the I'm only interested in the center line part of the Mississippi and portions of uh, central Louisiana. And that is something that everybody, including Baton Rouge, Lafayette, you need to be prepared for that possibility uh, this weekend. As you move a little bit further to the east, uh, North Shore area of the New Orleans area there, Covington, Mandeville, Slidell, um, it's still possible you could see uh, winds uh, gusting from 74 up to over 100 miles per hour. Again, you do not have to be near the center of this storm to have significant impacts. Winds of 100 miles per hour will do significant damage to both, both trees and, and possibly the power grid uh, for exposed lines. So uh, for those who are in those areas, I would definitely consider uh, in this time left um, to make sure that you have uh, consideration for what you would do uh, if you were without power as we move uh, later on in the weekend. Surge is another uh, devastating threat. It's probably one of the number one killers 
when it comes to uh, hurricanes and straw hurricanes. So uh, across most of the southern and the southeastern portions of uh, the coastline, we're talking about extreme uh, surge, uh, 10 to 15 feet surge possible from uh, the mouth of Mississippi uh, west to about Morgan City. Uh, from Morgan City to uh, intercoastal city, just a little bit less of that, um, roughly around six to nine, and then three to five to the Texas line. As you go the other way and you work your way from the uh, eastern portion of the mouth and wrap uh, around the boot uh, up towards the tidal lakes, um, you can see uh, seven to 11 on uh, the, the boot portion of the Louisiana coast and then in the tidal lakes, uh, four to seven. So again, the extent of the impacts are gonna be far away from where this makes landfall. So for anyone with coastal interests, understand that you will see a significant amount of water uh, move in. And depending on how large uh, the wind field uh, grows to and the movement and speed, these numbers may increase um, as we move a little bit closer uh, to the storm uh, making uh, landfall. So that is definitely something for, uh, for folks to watch because uh, higher amounts like that um, obviously will bring a, a lot, much larger amount of risk, especially possible um, in the Tidal Lakes area um, where there may not be a, a full levee system for everybody to be protected. Rainfall is another huge uh, issue with this storm. We're talking uh, 10 to 15 inches of rainfall over a large portion of southeastern Louisiana. Uh, there may be pockets of 15 to 20 plus depending on the speed and location of these bands setting up. With the rainfall that we're expecting uh, today, uh, that happened already today, excuse me, and uh, tomorrow, on top of the effects from Ida itself, uh, there could be significant inland river flooding. And so with that, everywhere that you see the, uh, the purple there across southeast Louisiana is where we're uh, looking for the possibility of extreme flooding to occur. This is right on the edge of the city of New Orleans, so obviously we could have some water problems there, and that'll be something we'll have to consider as well as things set up. But I, I just want to highlight again that it's not just the wind threat here that could do most of the devastation, it's the water threat that's usually one that ends up being the biggest killer. And uh, un unfortunately, a lot of people um, tend to try to move around when they start to get worried or scared as the storm starts to come in, and this is probably the worst time to move, especially with this coming in on Sunday evening, Sunday night. As you go in the nighttime, you do not want to be trying to drive around when we're seeing heavy rains that could be uh, creating uh, all sorts of river or, uh, or flooding that could cause your car to go off the road uh, and into, into water, and then um, unfortunately, um, you know, put you at, at uh, severe risk for loss of life. So just a quick uh, uh, overview of the threats here. Uh, the confidence is fairly high on the track. The track really hasn't budged for uh, the last day or two. Um, we are becoming more and more certain when it comes to the intensity that Cat 4 uh, at landfall looks uh, pretty much like it's uh, a really solid forecast now. And, uh, and with that, uh, all the threats of a very large storm with a little bit larger wind field uh, are in play with the uh, surge and the heavy rainfall. The one other thing that I did not mention is the possibility of tornadoes as well. And so as this comes on shore, especially on the eastern side of the shore, which will encompass much of uh, southeast Louisiana and portions of uh, uh, coastal Mississippi and southwest Mississippi, they'll be under the gun for uh, a possible uh, tornadic spin-ups, um, which is very normal for uh, landfalling hurricanes. So there are multiple threats. There are multiple things for people to be watching and, and keeping their eye on and making sure that they're prepared for. Uh, because again, I'll start off with the same comment that I started with, uh, is uh, I believe, uh, unfortunately, this is gonna be a life-altering storm for many people. And so the actions uh, that you do now are what uh, can prepare you to make sure that you can successfully navigate what Ida is gonna throw at us. With that, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ben, and uh, I don't know about you, but that's a very sobering assessment of what we can expect with Hurricane Ida. And I guess the, the biggest challenge is not just the strength of the storm, but how quickly uh, it is approaching after its initial formation. And we don't have 
the normal time that, that we typically have in order to uh, prepare for a hurricane of this magnitude. And, and that's why it's important that everybody take advantage of every minute that you have. We have announced that state offices in 38 parishes will be closed on Saturday, August the 28th through Monday, August the 30th. Um, and we may be announcing additional closures on Sunday, but we know these will be closed uh, Saturday through Monday. And I'm gonna go through those uh, for just a minute. Acadia, Allen, Ascension, Assumption. Of Oils, Beauregard, Calcasieu, Cameron, East Baton Rouge, East Feliciana, Evangeline, Iberia, Iberville, Jefferson Davis, Jefferson, Lafayette, Lafouche, Livingston, Orleans, Plaquemines, Point Capi, Rapid, I'm sorry, Rapides, St. Bernard, St. Charles, St. Helena, St. James, St. John the Baptist, St. Landry, St. Martin, St. Mary, St. Tammany, Tangebahoe, Terrebonne, Vermilion, Vernon, Washington, West Baton Rouge, and West Feliciana. I want to remind everyone, please do not drive once conditions deteriorate. That's why it's important that you do everything possible in advance and get to the place where you want to ride out the storm. If for some reason you absolutely have to get on the road, make sure that you are mindful of debris, downed power lines, and flooded roadways. Do not drive around DOTD barricades. And if you see standing water, please turn around. Don't drown. I encourage you to use 511LA.org or the 511LA app to see what state routes are open or closed because of the weather or other causes. And if necessary, find alternate routes uh, before you actually get underway. DOTD also partners with Google Maps and Waze, which are also travel resources that are especially beneficial in times like these. The CPRA is tracking 692 gates across the coastal zone uh, as of earlier today, a total of 182 of those are closed. We are anticipating the full closure of major floodgates in the hurricane risk reduction system around the greater New Orleans area, the Morganza to the Gulf, and the LaRose to Golden Meadow. We are aware of voluntary and or mandatory evacuations in five parishes. These orders differ depending upon where you live in the parish. So if you live in Jefferson, Lafouche, Orleans, Plaquemines, or Tanchebo, please refer to your local officials for instructions on evacuations. And whoever you are, and wherever you live or wherever you happen to be, make sure you're paying close attention to your local officials, especially the offices of emergency preparedness and parish presidents and so forth, uh, and follow their guidance. Currently, the Louisiana National Guard has over 1,600 guardsmen on duty preparing for this hurricane, uh, but also uh, doing all of their normal COVID operations as well. I've authorized General Waddell to activate the entirety of the Louisiana National Guard. There will be more than 5,000 soldiers available to respond. Search and rescue assets are currently staged in 13 parishes. We do have 64 high water vehicles, 60 boats, and 13 helicopters ready to support and assist the citizens of Louisiana. The Department of Transportation and Development led by Secretary Sean Wilson uh, and his team, they've mobilized 
uh, their high water signs and barricades and other equipment that may be needed to address issues related to the storm. This equipment will be utilized uh, when it is appropriate to do so. Uh, through an existing contract, DOTD currently has more than 70 coach buses and 20 parrot transit uh, smaller buses uh, in Louisiana. Uh, they are staged at two vehicle staging areas, one in the New Orleans area, one in the Lafayette area. Uh, by tomorrow morning, we will have a total of 125 buses staged in Louisiana. The majority will be at the New Orleans vehicle staging area. Uh, this afternoon, uh, and just a little while ago, I did direct that the Saints preseason game with the Cardinals be canceled. Uh, now that we've had an uh, update on the weather forecast and the severity of the storm is increasing, uh, and knowing how valuable every minute is for people to be preparing for this storm, uh, I did not believe it was appropriate for there to be an NFL preseason game taking place on Saturday afternoon, knowing that we're asking people by dark tomorrow night or bedtime tomorrow night, whatever you, however you want to say it, that they be postured and located uh, wherever they need to be and how they need to be to ride out the storm. It's never too early to start talking about post-storm safety as well. And I will remind you that in Hurricane Laura, we actually lost more people after the storm than we did during the storm to things like generator safety because of carbon monoxide poisoning uh, to people who, who were exor uh, uh, using uh, chainsaws and on roofs and that sort of thing, so, and, and uh, heat-related uh, issues as well. So everyone, please be mindful of this, and, and uh, there is a very good likelihood that for some period of time, a considerable part of our state will be without power. Not that we're not doing everything we can to uh, make sure that we can respond quickly. I can tell you there are already 5,000 linemen in the state ready to respond and almost 12,000 more uh, postured to come in when they're called. But there's going to be a period of time, uh, if the past is any indication at least, where many Louisianas will be without power. Many of those will rely on generators. Please make sure that you have those located well away from your home, uh, at least 20 feet not in a crawl space, not next to a window, and certainly not indoors or in a garage. Uh, and when you refuel the generator, let it cool off for at least 20 minutes before you do that. Finally, um, I know that uh, the fact that we're still in a pandemic makes this much more difficult for everyone as we prepare for and respond to uh, this hurricane. But the pandemic isn't going to leave just because it's more inconvenient. And so we just have to deal with it. Um, and I'm going to ask Dr. Cantor to come up. Uh, he will briefly go over today's numbers as well as some other safety tips. Because as we have, one of the concerns that I have is we're going to have tens or hundreds of thousands of people moving around Louisiana at a time when our percent positivity, although it's improved, uh, it's still well above 10%. There's an awful lot of COVID out there, and transmission remains too high, cases and hospitalizations. And if anybody has been paying attention to the death reports this week, you'll see that we've had some of the highest numbers at any point in the pandemic. Uh, and, and so I'm going to ask him to come up and go through some of the COVID-related information. I will then come back up, uh, make a few additional comments, and then we'll all take your questions. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. So, as you heard from Ben um, from the Weather Service, this is a, a powerful and dangerous storm. Um, it's moving a little bit faster than we had thought it would be, uh, which means that we have a little bit less time to prepare. So that's the first message to folks. Um, your normal timeline of preparedness for a hurricane has been cut down a little bit now. So take stock, make use of the time uh, tonight and tomorrow morning to prepare, as the Governor just said. We are thankful that our COVID numbers have softened just a little bit over the past week. 
um, in this really unprecedented fourth surge. Um, we have reported out an additional 3,428 new cases of COVID today. That's on 37,520 tests. And today there are now 2,684 COVID patients in hospital beds throughout the state. That number is down just over 300 count over the past week, um, which is encouraging because we were at a place a week ago where the hospitals just could not take anymore. So we are thankful for that, but um, as the governor said, the level of COVID out there, the amount of transmission out there, your risk, your chances of being exposed to and infected with COVID remain higher today than they have been at any point in the pandemic leading up to the beginning of this fourth surge. Percent positivity has gone down a couple points from our peak, but now it's at 14.1, which is still very, very high. There's a lot of COVID out there. There's a lot of risk out there. And as folks think through what their hurricane plans will look like and their contingencies, they need to take stock of how to keep themselves and their family safe from COVID. In most circumstances, that's going to mean limiting themselves to their family unit as much as possible, and when not possible, masking and distancing. This has been a difficult week. We reported earlier in the week our single highest fatality count from COVID to date at 139 deaths. We also unfortunately reported out two pediatric COVID deaths this week, one of which was in an infant less than one year old. There's still a lot of risk out there. The storm is not the only risk out there. COVID increases the risk. Please take stock of that. Please incorporate that into your hurricane plans. Again, if you need to be in an environment where you're mingling with people beyond your family unit, the things that will keep you safe from a COVID perspective are masking and distancing. Please keep that in mind. I'd also like to ask people, although our hospitalization census from COVID has gone down a little bit, it still is higher than it was in any of our three prior surges. The hospitals are still very busy. The hospitals are still in their own contingency plans. Many hospitals are still postponing elective procedures. Please avoid emergency departments unless you need it throughout this storm. If you're sick, by all means, go to an ER, but if your condition doesn't warrant an emergency department, please avoid the ERs throughout the storm because we're trying our best to preserve their capacity for what they have on their hands now and anything else that they might have to deal with throughout the storm. If you have special medical needs, including electricity dependency or oxygen dependency, do what you need to do right now to prepare. Contact your vendor, make sure you have your supplies, stock up, be prepared. If you need assistance with any of those, particularly with oxygen and you don't know where to go, start with 211. There are oxygen pickup points throughout the state. 211 will have the most up-to-date listing. If you need assistance with life-saving medical supplies that you and your family require, and you don't know where to go, 211 is the first place to go for that. The majority of the COVID testing and vaccine sites throughout the state are, are ramping down right now. Most south of I-10 have already closed, and the remainder will close at around 5 p.m. today. Um, so please keep up with those sites uh, throughout the weekend. There won't be much activity of that throughout the weekend. If you already had your first dose of COVID vaccine and you were scheduled to get a second dose this weekend, it's likely that will not happen, but that's okay. You should schedule, you should reschedule that second dose appointment for as soon as possible after the storm rolls through. We would like people to get their second doses on the specific date that they're supposed to, 21 days after the first for Pfizer, 28 days after the first for Moderna. But if that's not possible with the storm, it's okay to do it later. It's okay to do it one week later. It's okay to do it three weeks later. Just remember to do it later. So if you have to postpone your second vaccine dose appointment because of the storm, get that rescheduled as soon as possible. It still is beneficial to you. 
I want to talk for a second about preventable deaths during hurricanes, and, and the governor just mentioned this. We want to do all we can to limit preventable deaths during a storm. Some deaths are not going to be preventable, but many deaths are. During a storm, the number one preventable death is from motor vehicle accidents, particularly involving high water. Last year's storm season, we had 42 deaths, two of which were from motor vehicle accidents and high water. And during the floods this past May, four of our five deaths were from people driving through high water. If you don't need to be on the road during the storm, don't. And do what you need to do now to enable you not to be on the road then. Once the winds get above a certain speed, first responders are not coming for you. Fire, EMS, and police are staying put after the winds get above a certain speed, which means if you get into an accident, you're by yourself until the wind slows down. And if you get into an accident involving water, they might not be able to get to you at all. So please don't put yourself or your family or our first responders in harm's way. If you don't absolutely need to be on the roadway during a storm, don't. Stay home. Once the storm passes, as the governor mentioned, there are a couple other ways that we see preventable deaths every single storm, every single season. Number one is from unsafe generator use and poisoning by carbon monoxide. During last storm season, we had nine deaths from carbon monoxide related to unsafe generator usage. Carbon monoxide is silent. You don't know it's there until you or your family dies. If you do need a generator, it always must be used outside. It always must be kept well away from any air intakes. Don't keep it in the garage. Don't keep it in your house. Don't keep it just below an open window or an open air vent. And never use a stove to heat your house um, or to provide any, type, any other type of cooling. The other preventable death that we see every storm season is heat exhaustion. During last storm season, we had another nine people die from heat exhaustion. So if you have to do work on your house after the storm rolls through, try and avoid the peak of the day. Stay hydrated and don't push yourself. It's not worth it. I have to remind folks, again, this is, a, this is a fast moving storm, which means you have less time than normal to get yourself and your family prepared. If you're going to be evacuating and you're going to be around people beyond your immediate household, please mask and please distance. It's not worth putting your family in jeopardy of getting COVID because of this evacuation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanner. Um, while we're talking about COVID, I'm gonna go ahead and address the public health emergency that you all know uh, is set to expire next week. Um, and we have started to see some improvement in our data uh, that literally started exactly two weeks after the current mass mandate was put into place uh, in terms of reducing percent positivity of our tests. Uh, cases, hospitalizations, which have improved by a total of 15%. But even with these improvements, uh, we are still much worse off than we ever were in our first three surges. And none of the gains that we have made are irreversible. And that is especially true since 100% of all COVID cases in Louisiana today are attributable to the Delta variant, which is much more transmissible uh, and potentially more virulent as well. And so uh, with all that we're going to be dealing with next week, and because we are preparing for and responding to a major storm uh, during COVID, and we have every potential to lose whatever momentum we've been able to get uh, with respect to, to those numbers that I just mentioned, I can go ahead and announce today that our next uh, public health emergency will maintain uh, the indoor mask mandate in public spaces for those vaccinated and unvaccinated, uh, it'll start, uh, it'll be the exact same mandate that we currently have in place. We know that these mitigation measures work. Uh, we know that the vaccines are safe and effective. Uh, we're gonna continue to do those things that are required 
in order to make sure that we can uh, preserve as much hospital capacity as possible to deliver life-saving care. So as it relates to the hurricane again, remember that while we're going to have lots of people, lots of boats and helicopters, and we're going to do urban search and rescue just as soon as we possibly can, everyone is encouraged to have three days worth of supplies on hand. That's the rule of thumb. Uh, the first 72 hours is on you. Uh, and, and spend your time between now and the arrival of the hurricane to make sure you and your family can withstand 72 hours. Uh, if you are in uh, a difficult spot uh, and we can possibly get to you sooner than that, you know that we will. But you won't be the only one in difficulty. And so you can't count on that response being there as fast as you might like. So remember the first 72 hours is on you. Uh, and do what you can now and in the immediate aftermath of the hurricane to control as best as possible the spread of COVID-19. That means wear your mask. It means distance where possible. Wash your hands and so forth. So we have some time to prepare, not as much as we would like, um, but preparation is key. Panicking is the exact opposite of what we should be doing uh, right now. If you haven't done so, it is not too late to visit getagameplan.org and you will get a list of the things that you should be focused on between now and tomorrow night. Closely monitor your local weather and your local officials. Please do as you are directed. Uh, keep your phones charged. And if you want to sign up for updates from my office, you can text IDA. You can text IDA to 67283. And I know we've been through this many times before. That doesn't make it easier. And no, nobody should assume that this storm is going to be just like any other storm. They're all different. They all have their personalities. But this one has the potential, the likelihood to be very serious and very strong, uh, potentially uh, catastrophic uh, for some. So let's prepare. Uh, let's pray for what comes our way. Let's be good neighbors uh, to one another. So check on that elderly couple next door or across the street. Uh, call your mom and your dad or your grandparents. See if there's something you can do to help them tomorrow to get in a better position to withstand the hurricane. And with that, we will take a few questions, and you can direct questions to myself, to Ben Schott, to Joe Cantor, or to any of these public officials over here to my right. Yes, sir. So where evacuations uh, have been ordered, most are voluntary, there are some mandatory, uh, those individuals should be looking for shelter and guidance from their local officials. We obviously have uh, state shelters that, that uh, we are setting up uh, that will be operational as needed. If individuals want information about state shelters, uh, they should call 211. I can tell you we will focus on north and northwest Louisiana based on the track of the hurricane that you just saw uh, for our sheltering. And, and we always have medical special needs shelters that are open as well. Uh, but the first thing people should do if they need shelters is to contact their Office of Emergency Preparedness in the parish where they live uh, and take instruction from them. Uh, but if, if they do need uh, sheltering uh, that their parish isn't providing, you can call 211 and get that information. Yes, ma'am. Well, we, we have, um, and the other thing is we actually have 
contingency plans that in certain scenarios, and perhaps not this one, where we would actually uh, evacuate hospitals in certain coastal areas. That is impossible. We don't have any place to bring those patients, not in state, not out of state. So we have been talking to individual hospitals and to the Louisiana Hospital Association about them making all the preparations possible. Uh, and, and of course, we provide resources upon request to make sure that their generators are working, that they have way more water on hand uh, than normal, uh, that PPE uh, be on hand in, in, uh, in the amounts that they might need. And then to look at things that aren't necessarily things that we would typically experience. So, you know, what is it that, that's necessary in order to, to make sure that your efforts with respect to COVID uh, can continue uninterrupted? And then you start looking at things like oxygen supplies and so forth. And so we're, we're working with them on a full range of issues. Um, and we're encouraging them, just like we're encouraging indi individuals, to make use of every single minute uh, to be prepared uh, for this norm uh, but but evacuations are just not uh, possible and and so you know we're, we're having to work for example with the nursing home uh, association too uh, so that they can implement their point-to-point -point evacuations those that that are evacuating uh, because there have been times in the past where the more acute patients in nursing homes might end up in a hospital if something like this happens where well, the hospitals don't have room for them either. So the, the implications of having a Category 4 storm with a southeast strike while our hospitals are full are beyond what most people uh, normally contemplate and, and quite frankly beyond what our normal plans are, which is why we've been working so hard today uh, to fully coordinate. And I was on the phone earlier today with uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the president, and he had the FEMA administrator in the office with him, and I just told her, I said, be prepared to receive emergency requests for supplies that you wouldn't normally get. And we went through what some of those might be uh, because this situation really, and we use this word a lot, unprecedented, unique, but this one really is. Um, and so we, we were able to have that conversation, uh, and certainly I expect that that they will work as hard as they can to provide whatever those needs might turn out to be. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have plans to, to with, with certain strikes, to evacuate uh, hospitals. That is not something that we would do in this, in this uh, situation anyway, at least not uh, those within the hurricane risk reduction system. If you had one or two small hospitals that are much further south, you know, potentially, uh, but it's not something that we would do for this storm, but we always have those those contingencies in place. Any any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, well, I was wondering more on um, the people who were uh, evacuated in place, um, say, in hotels, or mm -hmm. in efforts to avoid conflict and such. Do you think, um, is there any sort of it's possible there are plans and we we expect that if we have to shelter enough individuals that that's what we would do it's another part of the conversation i have with the president today uh what well, would be on the need uh to quickly shift to non-congregant sheltering which means hotels now we're already in contact with hotels all across the louisiana to figure out where there's vacancy um, and we are modifying our shelter capacity to reflect the realities of COVID. And so our shelter capacities are not what they would normally be, although we can still uh, shelter many thousands of people. Um, but, but even if we, we were to, to do that, we would as quickly as possible transition away from that mass sheltering uh, to non-congregant shelters as, as we are able. So it, it absolutely is part of our planning. Uh, and it's something that we would want to execute if, if it becomes necessary. Again, it's just one of the realities of, of doing this in a pandemic, uh, such as the one that we're, we're currently experiencing. Uh, the good news is we have experience doing it. Uh, and at the height last year, we actually had 20,000 individuals who were in non-congregant shelters uh, actually spread across two states. Um, so we, we know how to do this. I hope and pray uh, we don't have to do it anywhere near that extent. Uh, but if we do, uh, we will. 
it won't be as easy simply because last year when Laura hit, there were many hotels that were practically empty. Uh, there are far fewer hotels in that situation today. Uh, and so uh, cobbling together the room space uh, could be a little more difficult. And that, that makes it logistically harder if you have to spread your shelter population across more hotels than would be necessary otherwise. Yes, sir. Well, you know, so, so for example, um, we, we've actually had uh, over the last couple of weeks some disruptions, and they were primarily uh, related to certain vendors uh, with respect to oxygen. And so uh, the number of patients who need oxygen, both in the hospital and at home right now, is greatly increased over what it would have been before the pandemic. And what we don't want to do is to create a situation where people start running low on their oxygen, start going to hospitals uh, that are already full uh, and, and, and extremely busy. And so making sure that we have uh, uh, a number of oxygen canisters on hand, which, by the way, we're already working on for ourselves, uh, but you never know how long this event could last. Uh, we might need additional help bringing some oxygen canisters into the state, getting those positioned uh, so that individuals don't have to unnecessarily go to the hospital, as Dr. Kanner uh, was saying. That's something that we really need to avoid. So that's just one example. But the truth is we can't sit here today and know exactly how all of this is going to play out. So, look, thank you very much. We will let you all know tomorrow uh, when... Uh, we will have another press event. I can tell you we will have a unified command group meeting in the morning. Uh, we're going to take a, a hard look at the 10 o'clock uh, forecast. Everybody out there should be doing the same thing um, uh, tonight and tomorrow. Uh, and please make use of all the time that you have between now and tomorrow night uh, to prepare for this storm, for yourself and for your family. Uh, take it seriously. Uh, this, this is going to be a very serious strong, uh, storm. You saw uh, the Category 4 winds uh, that we are anticipated, uh, the storm surge uh, that in areas could get, um, you know, uh, up to 15 feet and, and so forth. Uh, and also, when you start talking about rain uh, that in localized areas could approach 20 inches, I mean, this, this can, this can uh, pose a lot of uh, difficulties, a lot of threats. Uh, and dangerous, I should say. So let's let's all do what we can to be prepared, uh, and then let's respond as intelligently as we can, and as safely as we can, uh, and as quickly as we can to our fellow Louisianans who will be in need. Uh, so we will let you know when our next press conference is. Again, let's prepare, uh, and let's pray. And thank you.